Welcome to Stay at Home Cinema, brought to you by TIFF and Crave. I'm Cameron Bailey, the Artistic Director and the co-head of TIFF. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. We're going to watch the arrival of a fresh, new, homegrown Canadian talent, Jasmine Wazafari, and her film Firecrackers. We're going to start watching Firecrackers at 7.30 p.m. Eastern, 4.30 p.m. on the West Coast. And uh, we will live tweet as we watch. And across Canada, we are watching on Crave. Some shout outs before we begin. We're going to have Jasmine Mosfari joining us shortly, but uh, first I want to just acknowledge where we are. I'm speaking to you from Indigenous land, and I want to shout out all Indigenous creators and their communities from coast to coast to coast. Uh, we also want to acknowledge all levels of government, the Government of Canada, the Government of Ontario, the City of Toronto, who provide support to TIFF. I want to definitely acknowledge all frontline workers we're working so hard to keep us safe and healthy and fed uh, during COVID-19. Uh, we also get a lot of support from uh, organizations, corporate partners, uh, beginning with our lead sponsor, Bell, our major sponsors, RBC, L'Oreal Paris, and Visa, and a lot of donors and members. Maybe uh, you're one of them watching tonight. Thank you for keeping us going. Today, you may know, is Giving Tuesday, which is a global, global day of giving and this is a particularly uh, trenchant and important uh, Giving Tuesday because it is, of course, coming during COVID-19. TIFF is a not-for-profit, and like many cultural institutions, we have had to close our doors. and We're facing uh, some uh, pretty uh, severe uh, changes in our, our um, ability to bring uh, films to audiences. So we have set up our own fund, and I would invite any viewers who can to consider making a gift by visiting our website at tiff.net slash loveoffilm, and you can get more information there. Now, on to Firecrackers and Jasmine Wazafari. The film industry Bible a Variety called her a major talent. The Globe and Mail called her a vital new voice for Canadian cinema. She's a filmmaker with a bright future. We invited three of her short films to the Toronto International Film Festival before she made her feature debut with Firecrackers. And that film won the uh, Canadian Screen Award for Best Direction and also Best Editing. Uh, we at TIFF named it one of Canada's top 10 films of that year, 2018. And if you remember the intensity of life as a teenager, or maybe you are a teenager still now, when everything you're doing and feeling uh, feels like it's for the first time, Firecrackers really gets that experience. Mozafari was an honoree at the annual Burke's Diamond Tribute to the Year's Women in Film in, in 2019, where she received the Emerging Talent Award. And uh, this year, she was a TIFF Talent Accelerator participant, uh, which is a program supported by, her, by our Share Her Journey initiative. And she was also part of TIFF Writers Studio to develop her next feature. She grew up in Barrie, Ontario, before moving to Toronto. In addition to her short films, she's directed music videos and episodes of The Detectives and Holly Hobby. And she shadowed on the HBO drama Dare Me, and also in the new Phoebe Waller Bridge series run, which I definitely have to ask her about. Jasmine, welcome to Stay at Home Cinema. Hi. 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 Good to see you again. Um, I want to start by asking about the process of the shorts to, to feature. You made a short film called Firecrackers when you were at university. And I wondered, what was it about this story of two small town uh, teenagers that grabbed you then and held you all the way through making the feature? Mm -hmm. When I was in film school, I really was wanting to make a film where two teenage girls were unapologetic about everything about their own voice, about their sexuality, because at that time in 2012, there wasn't a lot of that. There was a bit, but it wasn't as common as it is now to see that. And so I did, I made that short, but it was only 15 minutes long and it kind of skimmed the surface of those themes of um, sort of, of female freedom, which I was really, and still continue to be quite obsessed with. Um, and then I graduated, I made two other short films and I circled back when I was going to uh, do a feature film and thought this is the time to expand uh, the short film Firecrackers into a bigger um, uh, feature film, basically. And that was because I wanted to explore the idea of freedom, basically, or the lack of freedom and how this theme of patriarchal oppression um, 
how, how I could explore that so much deeper in like a 93 minute film where I couldn't do that in, the, in a 15 minute film. And I'd grown too, as a person, I'd grown um, as, a, as, a, as a, an adult, as a woman, and also as a filmmaker. So there's so much more I wanted to say. And I think a lot of my films sort of have this social political uh, commentary. And I was like, how can I do that, but also make it somewhat accessible? Um, but I, I knew that this wouldn't be necessarily the most comfortable film I was gonna create. It was gonna be dark. I was very determined to wake people up to the fact that sort of uh, patriarchy is kind of keeping us all trapped no matter what gender uh, you are. So that was something that took me a long time to sort of dive deep into as a theme. And then from there create, center it all or base it all on character, make the characters feel real and authentic. And then that's the way into an audience's mind and heart. Mm -hmm. Um, you say you're obsessed with female freedom and, and you, you're talking about patriarchy is something that really governs all of our lives. How does that play out in terms of the story of the film? How do you kind of weave that into the narrative? Um, it's it's a drama after all. How do you dramatize those, those ideas? Yeah, it's like such a huge theme to take on. And, it, and I think when I was first conceptualizing it, a lot of people were afraid that I was becoming too academic or like it was going to be academic because that term patriarchy uh, a lot of people are afraid of it still yeah. to this day. And um, I, again, it was like, I was like, how can I find that through the characters? So for me, the way to do that was kind of this like Thelma and Louise type of approach. Cause that film to, to me is also about patriarchy. Um, so it's kind of like, I need a simple plot. I need like these girls want to get out of a small town. On the surface, yeah, that's what the film is about. Keep the plot simple. But underneath it all, when you dive into the separate threads of the characters of Lou, Chantel, Lou's mom, her little brother, and all the men in the film, I, I, I kind of was like, how does patriarchy affect each and every one of these people? Um, I tried to look at everybody's vulnerabilities and weaknesses and, and understand why they acted the way they did and have empathy for them. I think as a writer, as a filmmaker, you have to have empathy for every character you write, no matter how evil they might be. So that was, um, that was to me the way to make, I, I knew these people needed to feel real. They needed to feel realistic. Otherwise, um, I thought it could be kind of hollow as a film. So that was the way into that big theme for me. Mm -hmm. So much depends on the cast, uh, the two young women at the center of the film, played by Michaela Kermiski and Karina Evans. They're really essential to just giving the film that feeling of, of realism. How did you land on these two particular actors for these characters? Um, well, this was like a really low budget production, obviously. It was a really scrappy production in which myself and the producers had to do all the casting ourselves. We didn't have a casting director. And we didn't work with union actors either. Um, and we didn't have the budget for that. So we were casting online through Facebook, through Instagram. Um, and we found, you know, all these girls applied, like 250 girls sort of applied early on. And then we sort of narrowed it down, narrowed it down, narrowed it down. And then we saw about five people, six people in person. Um, and for both, Lou and Chantel, the characters of Lou and Chantel, and I read with them in an improvised 40-minute um, audition. Really? Uh, improvised. Yeah. Because and what I, were you looking for when you were reading with them? How would you know you had what to what you wanted? Um, for me, in a word, it's like vulner vulnerability. Like, can people be vulnerable in front of me, in front of the camera? Because that's really hard to teach. Um, I think either you're able to do that or you're not. And with uh, both Karina and um, Michaela, they were both incredibly vulnerable um, in the audition. Um, and Michaela, for instance, is so different from her character of Lou, which is, Lou is very aggressive. She's very Stop. competitive. Yeah. Yeah, but Michaela's not like that at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I knew I could, I could develop that part of her. The, the anger, we can, we can go into her backstory and develop that. But the vulnerability, I don't, in my experience, that's very hard to teach an actor, to bring out of an actor. I think either you have that or you don't. So with both of those, with both those actors, that's what I found. And that was a year before we shot. So like over the course of a year, we did all these improvs to build their backstory, to build chemistry between them. And so that they felt 
that they had lived the history as those two girls. Um, this is also saying because they hadn't had a lot of experience as actors. They hardly had done anything. So I Pretty knew- The director as well. She she makes films and videos her on, in her own right. Yeah, and she she was sort of starting that when we were starting the process of Firecrackers. And then after Firecrackers wrapped, then she really took off and like uh, was directing Drake videos and and huge huge videos. So like she, but at the time, you know, it was sort of the beginning of both of their careers, mm -hmm. of both of their acting journeys. So I was I was like, I can't throw this complicated script um, at people who haven't had a lot of training or experience and expect them to perform well. I need to be there. Their, um, I need to hold their hand through this. I need to guide them through this because I'm asking a lot of, of any actor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I want to ask you about the form of the film as well, particularly the camera work, which I think a lot of the reviews really picked up on. Um, I think your cinematographer is Catherine Lutz and it has this very um, kind of tactile handheld feel that the camera is very close to the characters a lot. The use of light, particularly natural light is really beautiful. How did you set about coming up with the look of the film with, with Catherine Lutz? Um, well, we started early on by discussing the emotional motivations behind the entire film and then literally scene by scene just like what is the emotional center of the scene and that's what guided our decisions in in the camera work rather than just like we i was very much like i don't want this to just be handheld for the sake of oh this is a cool stylistic approach and uh, kind of trendy at the time too like and i didn't want to i wanted to root it in in motivation mm -hmm. um but we we came up with the look because I, as I was writing it, I was like, this doesn't feel like a standard, like wide, medium, close up type of film. This film, we, I need to be immersed. Like, the audience needs to be immersed in this film with the characters. It needs to feel visceral because there's an energy that needs to be maintained until you get around to like maybe halfway through the film or later in the film. And then it really slows down. Mm -hmm. And I let the, um, I, I, I guess very intuitively just like, feel okay this this scene has a lot of energy the the kids there's a lot of optimism they're running on the beach and then later when they're when when their dreams are sort of crushed the camera doesn't feel to me like the camera needs to be more still it needs to be pulled back um so i just kind of was letting the emotions of the characters guide how much the camera was was moving or how close it should be um but it was always guided by emotion it was always guided by uh, the character's feelings, as opposed to being um, where I might in my future film work be more observational, pull mm -hmm. back, um, let the audience decide what they should be looking at. Right. Uh, so the cameras with uh, the characters as they're as they're going through these emotions, sometimes for the first time. Um, I've got a question from one of our TIFF members, uh, Giovanna Ramos. What are the best and worst things that happened on the set of Firecrackers? The whole the whole experience was like kind of a dream come true for me. Um, so like there's so many good things about being on that uh, set. I think I think it felt like the the atmosphere was very much on our side. Like we were shooting in southwestern Ontario, and there was a lot of rain that created these really weird and awesome skies that you'll see in the film. And and I felt like we always were shooting something, and there'd be like just this amazing beautiful sky um like at the end of the film when Lou's brother is in the field and he's running and he turns and he looks at the camera it's a very heroic shot there was like a rainbow in the background and so there was, there was a lot of like weird luck like that the worst thing that happened was at the end of the film i don't want to spoil it for people but um we were supposed to shoot the end <laughs> but go ahead go ahead yeah i won't i won't, I won't say too much but Basically a vehicle, the battery died on an older vehicle and we couldn't shoot the ending of the film um, on the day we were supposed to. But I secretly was happy because it was raining and gloomy. And once you watch the film, you'll understand why that wouldn't work for the end. Mm. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Another question from TIFF member Meroe Benny. Which directors do you draw your inspiration from? Um, up until, until Firecrackers, Andrea Arnold was a clear um influence for me um she i'd seen her film wasp when i was in film school i got like a, a dvd of cinema 16 dvd and it was like who, i didn't even know who made that film i was just like this film 
changed my life. And I was like, who did this? And I looked it up and it was Andrew Arnold. And then I watched um, Fish Tank and Red Road. I actually avoided watching American Honey until well after I had locked. Right. Uh, also about a young woman. Sorry? Also about a young woman. So I can understand why you might not have wanted to watch it then. Yeah, and also the style, like people were drawing comparisons very early on. So I was like, I don't, I, I'm very, I don't want that to be subconsciously influencing me. But her, Lynn Ramsey, uh, Gus Van Sant, and some of his like Elephant and yeah. um, that sort of darker death series, Jerry. Um, those would, I think, those are like the main, the main ones. Now I, I, have, those have evolved into other filmmakers. Now, but for up until Firecrackers, it was mostly Andrew Arnold, Lynn yeah. Ramsey. Who is it these days? I'm just curious. More Iranian filmmakers, so like Askar Farhadi and mm -hmm. Abbas Kiarostami and and those people, and um, Kenneth Lonergan, people who I think are like writing really tightly scripted things with really a talented actors, and and the script is really, really, really tight. I pro very opposite, I think, to my style before, and I it's something I want to get better at. So I'm mm. I, I'm looking more at those filmmakers. You have an Iranian background yourself. Did you grow up watching Persian cinema or was is this something you're discovering now? No, no, I was very disconnected from, I was connected to my Iranian heritage in a way, but also not because of the way my father had experienced shame for being Iranian when he arrived here in the early um, 80s. So he, he was very like protective of us in that way. And also I come from a family who was very like, um, like a doctor engineer type of lawyer type of family. And only when I was in film school and I started to realize I was like, I'm sorry, Iran like has all these amazing, the best filmmakers in the world and the best filmmakers in the whole world. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, how did I not know this? So to me, it's like, it's an, a, dis a discovery in my adult life. And I, I, I'm sad that I missed those films when I was growing up. Um, I think it's, it's a loss for me, but now I'm trying to make up, for lost time. You can catch up now. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a question from another TIFF member, uh, Julie Muchbahani. Uh, what advice would you give to aspiring female filmmakers? Um, I don't think you have to necessarily go to film school or anything like that, but I think you, I think as a female filmmaker, your voice is always not always valued in a room or the loudest in a room. At least in, when I went to film school, it was like that. You need to be able to block that out and just trust your own what's inside of you. What is the story that you want to tell? And literally just like keep your head down and focus on the work and just and people will if they resonate with the work, they will find you. Um, and I, I say that especially for female filmmakers, just because I think that's something that we need to be reminded of. Um, but uh, yeah, I would just just like find what you want to say and trust what you want to say and, and work at it and work at it. It takes a long time to become good at writing, good at filmmaking. It's not an overnight thing. So just keep making, making stuff if you can. And, and writing is free, right? Like I understand filmmaking is expensive, but writing, writing is something we can do with, with no money pretty much. So I would get good at writing and, and try to make small, uncomplicated, nice two-hander scene uh, uh, shorts, which I didn't do, but I wish I did. <laughs> <laughs> you've learned your lesson now. I've learned my lesson now, yeah. <laughs> no um, you've been doing a lot of work in between uh, Firecrackers and your next feature, which I know you're developing, uh, including some television work. I, I have to ask you about the Phoebe Waller-Bridge uh, series run. What can you tell us about, about that and, and working with her? Well, I was shadowing a director named Natalie Bailey on that show. And um, that was the first time I've ever been in like video village tent where the entire, everybody in there uh, was women. And um, Phoebe Waller-Bridge was, act she acts in the show a little bit and she's an executive producer. So she did come in and sit and give sort of feedback on certain scenes. I didn't dare say anything to her because I was so like such a fan. And I would dial it back a little bit, Phoebe, nothing like that. No, well, I mean, as a shadow, you're really supposed to be kind of a fly on the wall. Um, you can kind of talk to the director. It depends on the director, but I certainly felt like it wasn't appropriate for me to start talking to her. But I, um, there were some other writers there. It was just nice to like be able to hear them talk about the creative process as they're watching something being filmed. And um, 
yeah, it was, and watching uh, Donald Gleason and Merritt Weaver work, like watching actors of that caliber work was eye-opening to me and makes me want to work with them in the future. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Um, okay, we're gonna go to the film now. And for everyone watching, the way we do this is uh, we go over to Crave across Canada. We watch uh, Firecrackers on Crave. If you're not in Canada and you don't have access to Crave, find Firecrackers on whatever service you can. Uh, I think it is available elsewhere as well. Uh, we're gonna start at 7.30 p.m. Eastern time, 4.30 on the west coast of North America. Uh, there is some language, there's some mature themes, some drug use in this film. So it's not for kids, but it's about young people. Um, and uh, we're gonna use the hashtag tip at home and we're gonna tweet along as we watch as well. Jasmine, thank you so much uh, for being here and for helping us to introduce the film and thank you for making Firecrackers as well. Thank you, Cameron. This was great. Great. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye.